afternoon, brethren. It's good to see all you, brethren. Can't wait to see you when Jesus comes again. That's when you'll be like him, for you'll see him as he is, see? So it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but it will not always be that way. My text this afternoon is from Acts 20, 32. Um, Paul gives this commendation, a sensitive commendation to elders from Ephesus. And just to give you a background on this, Paul knew that he had a very short time left in the earth. He was coming to toward the end of his ministry at least. He knew that he would never make it back to Ephesus again. In fact, he told them, Behold, I know that ye all whom I have gone preaching in the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. And so that made Paul's words to Ephesus that much more critical. Paul knew that upon his leaving Ephesus, it would instigate a particular satanic assault upon the brethren there. In fact, he had told them, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. See, whenever a godly man leaves the world, they leave like a hole, an opportunity for the wicked one to come in and to assault the people of God. Paul knew that this was coming. For three and a half years, he had been telling them that this was coming. Now, Paul had, in fact, and we see this, when you look in Paul's writings, you can see that he had already been confronting this satanic assault that would rise up among the brethren. In fact, he told Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And so he had in fact been grappling with this spirit that was moving in this very direction. The Galatians themselves were already being confronted with another type of gospel that was a this do and thou shalt live gospel. You must be circumcised and keep the law to be saved. And so he told the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He was also dealing with the same thing among the Colossians. He told them, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And down in verse 8 of the second chapter, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They were being introduced to a how-to type of thing. Going back to the elementary principles of the world, see? It was another gospel, and Paul had to confront it. The Thessalonians were themselves also being troubled by another message. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. See, Satan was assaulting the church from within the church. He was bringing men who professed to be ministers of righteousness but were actually ministers of the devil into the church. They said, we're of God, we're of Christ. Some went out from the apostles. We're of the apostles. Maybe there were actually letters written in the name of the apostles to these churches telling them things that weren't true. It is a satanic assault, but it comes in the name of Christ. I'll tell you, brother, your greatest difficulties will not come from the government. Believe me, the greatest thing we have to fear is not a one-world government. 
It is a satanic assault that comes in the name of Jesus Christ. We call it Antichrist. It is not a message coming particularly from the world itself. It is a message coming from Satan, and it comes in the name of Christ, and it's said to be a gospel, but it's actually another gospel. That's what it is. It's another gospel. In fact, Paul knew the devices of Satan, and he told the Corinthians, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in the which the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That is the strategy of the devil, is to hide the true gospel by presenting another gospel. That's what he does. You see, Satan has no formidable arsenal against the grace of God. He cannot neutralize the potency of grace. Satan cannot do this. He cannot intercept the grace that passes from God to you. He cannot do this. Amen. If he could, he would have, believe me. He cannot hinder the work that grace is ably accomplishing in those that have received it by faith. So what does he do? He presents another gospel to turn men's attention away from the gospel. Because this is my message to you this afternoon. Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So what is he saying? Well, here's the bottom line of what I'm going to say today. I'm commending you to a gospel message by which grace is brought to you. And as long as you are faithful to the proclamation of that gospel message, grace will continually come to you. And wherever grace is present, God is present and is working his great salvation. That's what I want to tell you today. Now, he begins by saying, I commend you to God. I commend you to God. The meaning of commend is to place beside or near or to set before. Paul had, in fact, already been commending those whom he ministered to to God. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. So what's the bottom line of that? Paul preached Christ. In fact, you couldn't get Paul off the message of Christ. The only time Paul left that particular message, it was to deal with some kind of a diversion or a distraction, difficulties among the churches, but it was in order to get them back to the message because wherever Paul was, the gospel of Christ was being preached. We preach Christ. Did you know every single message that is proclaimed commits the people to some kind of trust? It compels men to trust in something. Paul's emphasis was Christ, and if you can get to the heart of the emphasis of any message, you will find out what that preacher is commending to you as a point of trust. Whatever that is, whatever that emphasis is, that is the focus. Paul's was Christ. To commend someone to God is also to place it down from oneself. That is, I, I, I have been myself protecting you and trusting you. Now I'm commending you to the trust of another. Not that God had not been, obviously, working through Paul, but Paul was leaving. And so he was commending the disciples to the trust of the living God. You know, a godly person, a godly man who is a minister has to be very careful that the people are being commended to God and not to them. If you've received any kind of virtue at all from God, you know there's this temptation in those who are not mature to do this very thing. John the Baptist's disciples, remember they did this very thing. Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more than they were, and they were upset about it. They did not understand this. Here's John the Baptist, this great man, and here comes this other man. And they're all going to him to be baptized. Remember what John said? He must increase, and I must decrease. A dispute arose among the Corinthians. They were carnal. 
They were divided one from another. Some were saying, I'm of Apollos. Some were saying, I'm of Cephas. Others were saying, I'm of Christ. I'm of Paul. And Paul had to say unto them, I have a planted, Paulus watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. What was he doing? He was commending them to God. That's what he was doing. Commending them to the trust of the living God. See? I am also reminded of the example of Jesus. Jesus had a similar occasion to the Apostle Paul. He was coming to the close of his own ministry. He was going to be leaving the world. He was going to commit himself to the final act before he left the world, his own death, and he knew that he could not commit himself to the keeping of the disciples. And so he said unto his own father, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. He commended them to the Father. Now I'll tell you, right there is an excellent example of what it means to be joined to the Lord in one spirit. See? You can, in fact, hardly find out where Jesus, the affection of Jesus left off and the affection of Paul continued on. They were... They were joined together into one. And so when Paul is leaving and not coming back to Ephesus, he does the same thing that Jesus does. I'm commending them to you, Father. I commend you to God. Now, why would he do that? Why commend them to God? Well, I think a real obvious reason, and yet I think it's important that we say it, because God is greater than Satan. You see, we are living, brethren, in the full-blown wake of this satanic assault that we call Babylon all the time. I mean, you can hardly go a day without hearing some kind of a falsehood, some kind of fable that's not true. It looks as if Babylon will swallow up the whole world, but after we've looked at Babylon, we have to look back at the living God and say that God is, in fact, greater than the wicked one. John gave this commendation to the disciples when he said, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'll tell you, Satan didn't want you to have grace, but you got it anyway. Satan didn't want you to know the truth of the gospel of Christ Jesus, and yet you know it. The Son has come and has given us an understanding in order that we might know him that is true. Satan didn't want you to grow up into Christ Jesus, and yet you find yourself, you're in the process of growing up right under his dominion. You're growing up. Satan doesn't want you to deny temptation, and yet you're able to do it. Every day you're saying no. How is that happening? Because the one that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And so Paul says, I'm commending you to God. If you're going to overcome Satan, you're going to have to be put in the trust of someone that is greater than he is. And there is none that is greater than Satan but God himself. The second reason why he is commending us to God is simply this, because God does, in fact, have an effectual care for his saints. Peter encouraged the brethren to cast their care on God because he careth for you. The saints are referred to as the sanctified ones in our text. What's his grace able to do? To build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Who are the sanctified ones? They're the ones that are set apart. Set apart for what? Set apart for God. That's who they are. When Peter proclaimed our identity, he said, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's who you are, a people of God's own possession. That's who we are. We truly are a special people. We really are. Titus 2.14 says this of Jesus, that he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. See? That's what he's doing. He's preparing a bride for himself. 
Now, I understand that men have abused this notion of, our, of how special we are before God, but let us understand this before we go on. We do not have any inherent worth to God. You do not have any value to God and of yourself apart from what God has put in you and given you. All of our value and worth to God is a result of what He has done in us. So we have no boast of ourselves. Amen. There our boast is in God. Amen. In fact, if you want to calculate the value of the saints of God, you go back to where God has made His invested interest in the cross of Christ Jesus. Amen. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with us also freely give us all things? Huh? God would not send his son to make such an such a amazing sacrifice to lay a foundation for the work of salvation and then, then forsake that work by not bringing the saints to glory. I'm commending you to God. I'm commending you to the one who's made the investment, and I'm commending you to the one that's going to make the investment pay off by bringing it to its completion. Last thing, I commend you to God for this reason, because salvation is impossible to men. From beginning to end, it's impossible. You didn't start it. You're not continuing it. Of yourselves, you know what I mean by that. I, yeah, you know what I mean. And he's the one that's going to finish it. You see, this is the way God is. Whenever God does a work, he puts you in a circumstance that only he can deliver you from. That's the way our God is. Huh? How is it going to be glorifying to God if anybody can do it? How is it going to be? It isn't that way. Whenever the Israelites went down into Egypt, this great and prominent nation, they made slaves out of them. How did they get out of that? God. He brought them out. I mean, what could the Hebrew children do when... Whenever Nebuchadnezzar says, go into the fiery furnace, I mean, what are the Hebrew children going to do? Say no. Hey, they've got to go. Yeah. And whenever Peter's sitting in prison, because Herod is seeking an opportunity to find favor among the Jews, and he's going to bring him out and kill him, what's Peter going to do? In that inner sanctum, chained with chains, he's going to wait on God because he can do nothing about it. And whenever you're faced, brethren, with this Babylonian monstrosity that we are faced with presently, I'm commending you to God. Amen. I'm commending you to God. Okay? Now he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That's quite a word. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Brethren, God uses means to bring about his salvation. He uses means. Whenever he wanted to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, he sent Moses. Did he have to send Moses? No, he didn't have to send Moses. He could have done that all by himself. God could have just killed Pharaoh. He could have killed all the Egyptians, and the Israelites could have just walked out. But he sent Moses. Why? To teach us how he works. God brings about salvation through means, okay? Amen. Whenever he wanted to bring the Israelites through the wilderness, he provided manna. It was like a daily salvation. I mean, who do you know that lives in the wilderness, but the Israelites lived in the wilderness? Could he have sustained them just without manna? Yes, he could have done that. He could have just, he could have just provided for them, put it in their body, and they would never have been hungry. Could have happened, but he used manna. Why? To teach us how he works salvation. God brings about his salvation through means. When Jesus wanted to pay his taxes, he did it through a fish. Did he have to do that? No, he could have, he could have just produced the coin right in his hand, given it to Peter, it would have been over. But God, Jesus tells us how God works his salvation. He does it through means. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Because the word of his grace is the means. It's the means by which God keeps and saves. 
the word of His grace. What is the word of His grace? Well, it is, in fact, the gospel of the grace of God. He tells you exactly what it is when he talks to those Ephesian elders. He said, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Yes, the word of His grace is none other than the gospel. That's what it is. It's the gospel. Now, this, uh, our preaching festival is about the identity of the gospel, so let's just lay kind of a few things about the gospel. And I'm saying these things in view of the fact that there are other gospels that are out there. And I want to just expose a few of those things. I know that we do this on a regular basis, but it's good for us to continue to do this on a regular basis. Maybe there are some who are actually trapped by some of these other gospels and who need to hear these things. So what is the gospel? First off, the gospel is a proclamation of what is spiritual in nature, not what is physical. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. How can a God who is a spirit, and why would he produce a salvation that emphasizes what is physical while he is spirit? That doesn't make any sense at all. The grace of God is a spiritual commodity. It brings a spiritual salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation. See? It's a spiritual commodity. You cannot take grace down to the local store and exchange it for anything. It doesn't have, it doesn't have that kind of value, but it does have great value in the spirit. See? It is a spiritual message that we are being given. So that when you hear a health and wealth message, think of how contrary that sounds. Think of how blasphemous it is when the gospel focuses on what is spiritual and a man commends to God what he calls a blessing from God through Christ that centers in health and wealth. It's wrong. It's not right. Not at all. The gospel is a spiritual message. It is a proclamation of realities, not fables. I think this escapes people. I think the conduct of people in churches and the casualness by which they come into what they call a church betrays this very condition, that they don't see the realities of the gospel. God is real. The commendation of the Apostle Paul was to God who is real. He is the living God. The grace of God is real. It is. It truly does come to men. It truly teaches men. See? It's real. It's astounding that we even have to say something like that in our day. The Apostle Peter said, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We're not telling tales. Why? Because you cannot build your faith on a falsehood. You wonder why, brethren, some of the brethren that are among us who are elders, who are so sensitive that we, what we say is correct, this is why. Because if we get caught up in what is false, grace will not come to us. Amen. So it's good for us, brethren, to not be sensitive when you have to be corrected. Just keep this in mind. It's the word of his grace, and that word is truth. Remember Jesus saying that to God? He said, thy word is truth. When we speak, we speak of spiritual realities. It's amazing how many fables there are out there right now. That tells you what kind of times we're living in. The gospel is a proclamation of divine working, not human duty. I know we've said this. I know that Brother Given said it in his introduction. I was able to hear that on live stream. God is the primary worker in salvation. Otherwise, Paul would commend you to someone else. God is the primary worker. Maybe you've not heard this. The secret to divine blessing is obedience. This is another gospel that's being foisted. Is that true? No, that's not true. You are saved by what he has done and your faith in that. That is the foundation. By grace are you saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. 
The gospel is a not this do and thou shalt live gospel. It is a this believe and thou shalt do and live gospel. See? <laughs> it's a different kind of gospel. See? I love to think about God's work in our salvation. If you look back to your own conversion, you will find God there present to working. God is the one who sent a preacher to you. For how can they preach except they be sent? God is the one that drew you to Christ because no man, no man can come to the Son except the Father which has sent him, draw him. He's the one who did that. Jesus is the one that washed you unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. God is the one that justified you because it is God that justifies. And Jesus gave you understanding for the Son of God came and gave us an understanding. See, I'm... You can see God, no matter where you're looking in salvation, whether you're looking to the past or whether you're looking to the present or whether you're looking to the glorious future, it is God that is the primary worker. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. In fact, what contributions you make, and certainly none would give the notion that works have nothing to do with salvation. What we do has nothing to do with salvation. That's another fable. That's a strange notion since we are the ones being saved and our doing is a confirmation that we are saved. That's a strange notion. But our doing is made effectual by his doing. Amen. And by the grace which he, is, which he dispenses unto us. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Now, I... I appreciate being able to see a little bit more into this, some things that I hadn't seen before. The word of his grace. This is a very particular view of the gospel. See, there are different ways in which the gospel is presented. It's referred to as the gospel of Christ. It's referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. In fact, we're looking at all those right now. But mine is the word of his grace. Word actually means spoken word. It is a word that's articulated by a living being, God being the preeminent living one. Now, God has already demonstrated that he works powerfully his works through his word. He's already demonstrated that. In fact, you look all about you, this very creation itself. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. It's a marvelous display of power and it's a continuing testimony to God. Another one of those great testimonies to his power by working through his word is the Israelite nation altogether itself is the result of God's spoken word. Remember when he said through Ezekiel, he said, I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood. And I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Hey, that's why Israel is here today, because God said, live. Now, I think the example that we find in Ezekiel seems to be more closely associated with what the word of his grace is from the perspective of our text here. You remember... God brought Ezekiel down into a valley of dry bones, and he caused him to pass throughout those bones. Had to be well acquainted with death. That's the way it works with God. God lets it get really bad and really dry before he works. And so he went among those bones and was passing throughout those bones, and he noticed that they were very dry. They'd been dry for a long time. You remember what God told him to do? prophesy. He said, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You remember what happened? Exactly what he said was going to happen. Because God there showed us that when he brings about salvation, he works through a message of what he has declared that he's going to do. Now, my brethren, that is what the word of his grace is. It is the message of what 
God is going to do. See, God is the one that was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. See, that's what it was. God, because of his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved through faith. So what is that? That's the word of his grace. Because that is how God works his works. Is men, when men proclaim the message of what he has declared he will do. I think that's a marvelous thing. To me, it's a marvelous thing that God can dispense grace through a message. You remember when Barnabas passed down through, there was, remember this great persecution that arose over Stephen's martyrdom? And there were brethren that were fleeing, but they were preaching while they were fleeing. And some had gone down to Antioch, and it says that they preached Christ. Great work of God was taking place down there. So the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas down there to see what was going on. And the scripture says of Barnabas that when he had seen the grace of God, he was glad. How did he see the grace of God? He saw the work of God being accomplished. That's what he saw. You see, wherever grace is present, God is present. And God is working to fulfill his work through that grace he dispenses through that message that men preach. That's how it happens. It's a marvelous thing that heavenly resources can actually pass to the saints by faith in the message of the gospel. That's a marvelous thing. Ephesians 4.29, you know what you say can actually minister grace to your brethren. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace. So choose your words carefully, brethren. What you say can make it harder on somebody, or you can actually assist them. Your words can be a conduit through which grace is supplied to people that need it. I'll tell you, when you realize the potential of your speech in speaking to saints, it encourages you. It says, I'm going I'm to give, I'm going I'm to be the, I know you don't have control over this, but this is God working through you. But God honors the, rec the record of his son, Jesus. I'm going I'm to give the record of his son. I can see this saint over here, he's discouraged. I'm going to give the record of his son. I'm just going to recount some of the things that God has done in Christ, and pretty soon that saint's flying. What's happened? Grace has been dispensed through what you said. I'll tell you, that's a marvelous thing. When you recount your conversion, when you first heard the message of the grace, here's how Paul rehearsed it to the Thessalonians, but it's true of all of us. He said, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and what? Belief of the truth. That's how it came. Hmm? The grace that saved you and brought you into Christ came through a preacher preaching the gospel. That's how it happened. That's marvelous. And by the way, God is still doing that. Even in this tragic day in which we live, God is still doing this. How about this one in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2? I think Brother Vic ministered this last night. But Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. You see, you've got to be in the right frame of mind to receive grace. Another gospel actually puts you in the frame of mind from which you can't receive grace. That's why you better take careful heed to who you subject your ears to. God doesn't honor any other message but this one because it puts you in the frame of mind where you can receive grace. If you recount every time you receive grace, it's because your thinking was being modified by the word of his grace. That's how it came. Oh, well, that's what edification is, brethren. That's what it is. The word of his grace. Well, let me, let me just hasten on here. He calls it the grace that is able. I'm just going to say this real quickly because I, 
I've got to bring this to, to a close, but the word of his grace, which is able. You realize it seems like most of the time when we hear people talk about grace, they associate it with inability. You notice that? They say things like this. Well, I, you know, I, I'm not home yet and I just continue to fail, but I'm so thankful for the grace of God. And that's how they use it. God associates grace with ability. You see, grace is a worker. In fact, you might call it the active agent in the work of salvation. You go to the store, you've got your prescription, you want to find the generic brand because you don't want to pay the hefty price they have for the real one, and what do you do? You look on the ingredients and compare. Does the generic brand have the same active ingredient as the other brand? And if it does, you buy it. Why? Because you know it's going to work. That's what an active ingredient is. It works. See, the grace of God works. It works through the gospel. It works. It makes you sufficient unto every good work. The scripture says that we have a throne of grace that we can come to in the time of need. See? I'm thankful for that. You will never, brethren, have any legitimate need to which grace cannot minister to you. That's the, sen that's the sense in which they shall not want. Why? It's because of the grace of God. The grace of God brings salvation. It teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this age, this evil age, and to look for his son. See, it does all those things. Wherever men aren't denying, they haven't received grace. Wherever they're not living unto God, they haven't received grace. Wherever they don't have an expectation of Jesus, they've not received grace. But let me tell you why that's happening. It's because there's another gospel out there. Men are never going to get free from sin without the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are never going to be able to live under God without the proclamation of Jesus Christ and the gospel. They are never going to have a heavenly expectation without the proclamation of the grace of God. The grace of God is able to do these things. The grace of God can bring you everlasting consolation. Everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Grace can make you fruitful. It can do that. Grace, think about this. Grace can keep you ministering effectually while you're infirmed. Remember what Jesus said to Paul? My grace is sufficient for thee. Remember what he gloried in? Infirmities. Why? Because Paul wasn't distracted by infirmities. It is astounding to me what the Apostle Paul was able to get done. You would think he never was infirm, but he was infirmed. But he was able to do what God had called him to do. See, don't think of infirmities, brethren, as an occasion to not minister. Think of it as an opportunity to minister. Because your infirmities make you suitable for strength outside of you. You've got to learn to trust in strength that isn't in you that you get from him. And when you're weak, he can make you strong. I'm glad for that. Amen. This is the word of his grace. Now this last thing, he says that his grace is able to build you up. I'll close with this. It's able to build you up. Up's the mode. That's the manner of the kingdom. It's the way we escape from the wicked one is going up. Remember Jesus told those, remember the, that this great desolation that was coming on Jerusalem? Remember what he said, flee of the mountains. Because if you're going to overcome the wicked one, you're going to have to flee upward. It's the way it works. But you also grow. He says this grace is able to build you up. Think of this translation that I thought was so good. It's able to build upon. It's able to build upon, that is to say, to finish the structure upon which a foundation has already been laid. See, let's, don't think of building up as just what it's doing for you now. Think of what it's ultimately doing for all of us. You remember Jesus talked about the cost of discipleship, and so he gave this analogy. He said, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first? 
and counteth the cost, whether we have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it. So what is that? That's building up. See, a structure is built through its completion by being built up. This is so important that we see this. What is the ultimate end of edification? An edifice, a structure. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, in the work of salvation, God is building a structure for himself. A habitation of God through the Spirit. And Peter said that we are lively stones, part of that building process. He said, to whom coming as unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up. A spiritual house. That's what God is doing. See? When we gather together and proclaim the gospel and encourage one another, and we're edified, and the grace of God is being dispensed, what is happening? God is building his church. That's what's happening here. God is building his church. And he's already been doing this for a long time. Hmm? From the very beginning, God has been building. He has been building his church. You know, whenever, uh, whenever it came time to erect a more permanent structure, a sanctuary for the living God. David wanted to do it, but he wasn't able to do it, so he accrued the resources, and his own son, Solomon, was given this charge to build a sanctuary for the living God, which he built of stone. It was to be a permanent structure. And the scripture says that when that temple was in building, that the stones were being hewn in a site away from the place where it was being brought together. And the precision of the building was so precise that when they brought those stones to the place where they were to be brought together, that the scripture says that there was neither an ax nor a hammer heard when it was being put together. Now, brethren, this is the ultimate end of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what this is all about. Except God, unlike Solomon, was not merely building in the present time. He's been building from the beginning. Shaping and gathering stones from Adam and Eve all the way up to the last man that will believe the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what are those who didn't hear the gospel? God's already brought them up to speed. You know what Moses and Elijah did when they were with Jesus? They were talking about the death he would accomplish. They've been brought up to speed. But this is what God is doing. He's building his church. He is spanning time and culture and space. And he is drawing out men. And he is shaping them and preparing them to be brought together into one in the fullness of the dispensation of Jesus Christ when he gathers all things together in one in Christ Jesus. Now that's what he's doing. So edification, brethren, isn't just about you being encouraged today. Although it is about that, it's not only about that. It's about this continual proclamation of the truth of the gospel because that's the environment in, when, in which the, show, the stones are shaped for the final building when they're brought together. Now, I think this is a marvelous thing, brethren, that God is doing. I'll tell you right now, when we all come together to partake of that inheritance of the saints in light, there's not going to be any necessary orientation at that time. Amen. No necessary orientation. In fact, when Peter saw Elijah... He didn't have to, have to ask, well, who is that? He knew exactly who it was. Uh -huh. 
And when we sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are not going to feel out of place. Amen. That's what edification is all about. Jesus says, I will build my church. And if you will commit yourself, brethren, to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can trust in this, that God himself will see to it that you as a lively stone will fit perfectly into the building when it's brought together into one in Christ Jesus at that time. So let me just leave this last word with you. I, I, uh, I was listening to, to Brother Pat's message, and I was thankful for, for his word because it actually is uh, the final word that I wanted to give you tonight. It comes from the end of the book of Romans 16, 25 to 27, and this will be my closing. He says, unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Thank you, brethren, for your time.